Derek Chauvin, day 24. The defense is now up. Eric Nelson and Derek Chauvin have to present their case to the jurors. And they got to be pretty compelling because the government has now finished. They have presented their case in chief. And so today we're going to see that the defense went, came out guns blazing. We have, it looks like six different witnesses that we're going to get to today. So here I want to show you, we're starting to assemble our witness panel chart. This was what the prosecutors look like. And there are even people missing from their list of witnesses because I didn't start this until about, I would say, four or five days into testimony. And so you may recall that we finished up last week with the law professor and Floyd's brother. You're going to see some familiar faces because here today we have Officer Crichton. Uh, he was from the 2019 incident. We have not heard from him yet. We have Michelle Mosgill, who was a paramedic in the 2019 case. Of course, we hear about Shawanda Hill. She was a passenger in the car in the 2020 case. Then we have Officer Chang, who was on scene, but was not one of the other four officers that was directly on Floyd's body. So, of course, he did not get charged with a crime. Then you may recall that we heard from Officer McKenzie. Now, she testified in the government's case. You may recall her over here. She was the crisis trainer, and so the defense brought her up as well, and she testified today. Then we wrapped up testimony this afternoon with Officer Broad, who is somebody who is uh, testifying about use of force. So we've got a lot of people to get through today. Let's get started by talking about this guy. So his name is Creighton. He's a retired police officer, and he was the first witness to come into court this morning. He was on duty back in 2019. So this was May 6, 2019. A lot of conversation about this prior offense from George Floyd back during 2019. Obviously, the defense wants to get this in because this was very, very similar to what we saw happen in May of 2020. If you recall, in 2019, very similar set of circumstances. George Floyd was in the vehicle. Well, we're going to see it, actually, so I don't even need to, to explain it. But you're going to see what happened. And so he is somebody who was on the force, right, in Minneapolis, testifying about what happened almost one year ago. Here he is. Members of the jury... Uh, you are about to hear evidence of. Well, let occurrence. me back up a little bit. I forgot forgot to mention this. So before we get there, the judge uh, gives what's called an admonishment. So he or, or something very similar, but he's basically warning the juries, jurors that they're about to hear testimony, but they should not be considering this except for very very limited purposes. And so the judge did this a few times today, which is why I forgot. I wanted to pause and just point this out. There are some very clear rules about what you can say and how you can say it and what evidence it's being proffered for and what you're trying to prove. What's the whole point of the conversation? So before several witnesses today, the judge just talked to the jurors and said, listen, you're going to hear from this person, but it's only about this issue. Very, very limited. And so this is the judge giving them that instruction. Following George Floyd on May 6, 2019. <coughs> this evidence is being admitted solely for the limited purpose of showing what effects the ingestion of opioids may or may not have had on the physical well-being of George Floyd. This evidence is not to be used as evidence of the character of George Floyd. Mr. Nelson. All right, so it's just for the impact of the opioids. It's not for character. It's not to say, hey, this guy's a criminal. It's not to say anything about the fact that yeah, there was a law enforcement incident that happened in 2019. It's only about the medical component about this, about this whole ordeal. How did the opioids, how did the pills affect his heart in this case in 2020? And so it, it's, it's you know being admitted for that purpose, but it looks very similar to what we saw in May 2020, very similar to 2019. And so they go through this series of questioning, a line of questions with this officer Creighton, and Nelson is really trying to uh, get him to lay some foundation so that they can get the body camera admitted so that they can play this in front of the jury because it's a pretty damning video. Very similar. You're going to see the George Floyd. Uh, I don't want to color your perception of it. So let's just go ahead and take a watch. This is the 2019 incident that was played in front of the jury today. Can you undo your uh, seatbelt, sir? <clears throat> Sir, passenger, can you undo your seatbelt? Go ahead, go ahead and undo your seatbelt. I, I, don't, I don't plan on shooting you. I'm just saying, just take it, take your time. Okay, relax. Just undo your seatbelt. Let her take care of her guy. Just keep your hands out where I can see him. Hey! Let me... 
Keep your hands where I can fucking see them. Okay? Put them up on the dash. Put them on the dash. I'm not going to shoot you. Put your hands on the dash. Put your hands on the dash. Last time I'm going to tell you that. It's simple. He keeps moving his hands around. He, keep, he won't listen to what I have to say. Okay? Put them on, the, on your head. So that's all I have for that. So you'll notice very similar, right? Cops came upon them. They're in the vehicle. A lot of interaction, a lot of freaking out going on from Floyd. And you heard the officers. I'm not sure if you could hear it there. I, I, I elevated the volume. I uh, went into Adobe Premiere and sort of jacked up the volume, cleaned up some of the noise a little bit. But you should have been able to hear that there was an officer shouting through the pass through the drive uh, driver's side of the vehicle. Something to the effect of spit it out, spit it out. What'd you put in your mouth? Spit it out. Take it out. You know, all of that stuff. And this is where I think we're going to see some more of the you know last minute ingestion theory come into play at some point in this trial. It may not even be until closing arguments. So that is what we saw. The jurors saw that they, you know, they've already had some interaction or some belief from other witness testimony that there, there may have been last minute ingestion. We know that there was a pill that was found in the back of the police car that had George Floyd's DNA and saliva on it. We saw the image, the photograph of the uh, sort of the white object. Don't know what it was. Could have been gum, could have been, you know, saliva, or it could have been a pill. We saw the two pills that were photographed by the forensic uh, inventory person who, who received the vehicle. Now what we're hearing is, somebody says spit it out in 2019 right so what what nelson is hoping the jury believes is well if he did it in 2019 maybe they did it he did it again in 2020 so all of that got played today then we fast forward a little bit and what, what they, they, if you saw that last clip was sort of broken up they had a sidebar a couple objections whatever was going on and then they come back out and eric nelson asked that officer officer creighton hey who was that in that video did you subsequently identify the uh, driver of the, or excuse me, the passenger? Yes, I did. And who is that? Mr. Floyd. Um, Your Honor, based on the court's ruling, I have no further questions for this witness. All right. So uh, that was that witness. Now, on cross-examination, it, it was interesting. So we saw... Uh, that, oh, early this morning, it was Mr. Frank. Now we have Miss Eldridge, who is the an, another prosecutor we've seen a lot of recently. She comes out and she does a cross examination with this officer, and it's very interesting. As I said, you know, in this trial, we're all kind of wearing different hats a little bit. Typically, I'm a defense lawyer. Typically, we go against the cops, and the cops are sort of, you know, uh, lining themselves up circling the wagons, bulletproofing themselves, you know, making themselves invulnerable against any defenses. So when you see a prosecutor go against sort of a police officer as we're going to see, right? This is a police officer. He's retired now, but he used to be on the force back in 2019. So now we're going to see a prosecutor from the same state come in and kind of go after this guy a little bit. Hey, you're kind of screwing up there a little bit, weren't you? Because he is now on the defense witness. He's a defense witness. So this is interesting. She comes out and she says, hey, it's kind of difficult to follow commands from police officers when you're all barking orders at them from multiple different directions. You're, you're somebody's on the other passenger side saying, put your hands on the wheel, uh, put your hands up. You're saying, put your hands on the dash. You're both shouting. You both have guns out. It's madness. It's chaos, which is true. It is true. We saw that yesterday with the Lieutenant Nazario case, right? It can be very chaotic. Oftentimes the cops don't recognize that. They just think that anybody on the other end, the receiving end of their, 
actions should just automatically understand and respond as though they're speaking clear, perfect English in a very low volume and a conversational setting in the room somewhere. It's not how it works. This stuff is very aggressive, hard to hear, hard to understand, which is something I, I can empathize with very clearly because of what I do. But typically the prosecutors are not the people making that argument. Typically they're making the other argument because the defense has to say your officer was acting unreasonably. In this case, now it's the prosecutor who's going against a former officer from her same state who now she's saying, hey, maybe what you did was difficult for a defendant to interpret. And so it's a topsy-turvy world. It's like bizarro land. We're all living in the the uh, twilight zone. Here it is. This is the, the prosecutor cross-examining an officer today. Good morning. You testified that you were the officer who approached the passenger side of the vehicle. You approached George Floyd on May 6th of 2019. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. And you had your gun drawn when you approached Mr. Floyd. Isn't that right? Yes, I pulled it. Yes. And when you approached Mr. Floyd, he said, don't shoot me, man. I don't want to get shot. Right? Something like that. Yes. You told him to undo his seatbelt, correct? That's correct. Yes, ma'am. And he did that, right? Yes, he did. And then you said, put your hands where I can see them, correct? Yes. And then he put his hands in the air? Yes. And then you told him to put his hands on the dash, is that right? That's correct. And that was when you grabbed his hand and forcibly put it on the dashboard of the vehicle, correct? Oh, and yes. And then the other officer with you on the other side of the vehicle changed that to put your hands on your head, correct? That's correct. And then he put his hands on his head, right? That's correct, yes. And there was one officer who said they were going to tase him, right? That's what I heard, yes. And you were yelling pretty loud, correct? Yes, I was, yes. It, it escalated real quick. Some profanity as well, correct? Yes. And you had your gun drawn the whole time you were giving commands, right? Once I started ordering him and he refused to show me his hands, yes, I, eventually it escalated where I pulled my gun, yes, ma'am. And he was awake, correct? What's that, ma'am? Mr. Floyd was awake. Was he awake during this incident? Yes. He was conscious? Yes. He didn't appear to be in medical distress to you when you were pulling him out of the car, is that right? He was... Yeah, so he had some difficulties hearing which was kind of interesting given the fact that they were asking him a lot of hearing questions Do you you heard him say this and you heard him say that right and the guy really had a difficult time even hearing in court so you know not not real sure how how effective that was but it was really kind of irrelevant they needed him to get the video into court just so that they could play it in front of the jury mission accomplished nelson got that done cross-examination comes out not really particularly consequential one way or the other so that was the first witness. We changed gears. Now we get to Michelle Mosang. She was also there in 2019. She is a Hennepin County paramedic. And so after that, after George Floyd was pulled out of that vehicle, uh, paramedics came again, very similar to what happened in 2020. And she took his blood pressure, sent him right to the hospital based on what she found because the blood pressure level was so high it was basically on the verge of death and so uh I, let, let's play this real quickly and then we'll we'll see what's next so uh, this is her he had informed you he had taken some some sort of an opioid uh every 20 minutes or something like that correct and then another one as the officer came up okay so he yeah, and I, I want to point that out, right? He said he was taking opioids every 20 minutes or so, seven to nine, seven to eight of them, whatever he said. And then she sort of you know, inserts in there. And he also mentioned right before the cops came, he also took pills right before that. So she that's her testimony he today. He told you that he had taken a pill um, at the time the officers were apprehending him. Correct. Did you do a physical assessment of Mr. Floyd at that time? Yes. Specifically, did you take his blood pressure? Yes, I took a set of vitals. Um, would you agree that uh, your first vitals were taken at approximately 134 and 59 seconds? Without looking at the run sheet, I wouldn't know for oh. sure. It, would it refresh your recollection to review the run sheet? Yes. May I approach the witness room? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I fast forward okay. a little bit. This is almost two years later, right? I mean, how can you remember this? 2019. Uh, first recorded vital signs. That refreshes your if you need to refresh your memory with that, just let us know and we'll... 
at approximately 1334, that's 134 p.m., agreed? You took his vitals, correct? Correct. And that would include his bl blood pressure at the time? Yes. And did you record what his blood pressure was at that time? Yes, it was 216 over 160. Did you ultimately make recommendations uh, to transport Mr. Floyd to the hospital? Based on that and other issues. Okay. Um, and ultimately, did he was he brought to the hospital? Eventually. All right. I believe that's uh, all I have, Your Honor. That's all. Okay, now you see what happened there? <clears throat> did he go to the hospital? She goes, eventually. Right. And so, so that's, that, you know, that question might have been an objection question, but, you know, there was something there that she's like, you know, we were trying to get him to the hospital, but he was being very difficult, I think is probably what she was saying. And this is just speculation. This is not in evidence, of course. But she said, yeah, eventually. But she couldn't say, yeah, after we, you know, subdue, subdued him and all whatever, she couldn't go into that because it's not relevant. Her testimony here today was only about any medical ramifications, any consequences to Floyd's body in 2020 as a result of what happened in 2019. So, you know, she she was a little bit, you know, bland there. Sounds like she could have added a little bit more flavor to that meal, but chose not to and could not because of the limited scope of her testimony. So, uh, you know, a, another another 2019 fact that got brought in front of the jury today. We're going to see how that lands. So that is that. Then we change gears. We get into the May 2020 case. And now we move over to Shawanda Hill. Shawanda Hill is this woman. And you may remember her from one of the body cameras. And I couldn't remember her name yesterday. Uh, somebody asked a question. Are we going to hear from Shawanda Hill? And I was like, who the heck is that? Who are we talking about? But then, yes, it's her. She was these. There was there were three people in Floyd's car. And we already heard about Maurice Hall, who is going to be invoking the, the Fifth Amendment uh, right against self-incrimination at some point, taking pleading the fifth. And there was a, another person who was in the passenger seat in the back seat, And it was Shawanda Hill. And so she was there. There is body camera footage that we're going to see where well, I'm not sure I clipped it, but from uh, Officer Chang, who was in court today, another witness from the defense. And you can see in that video that she is there and Officer Chang's communicating with her quite a lot. And so she was brought in, into court today to talk a little bit more about George Floyd's demeanor. She saw him inside of Cup Foods while he was in there uh, allegedly passing this counterfeit $20 bill. And then she also saw him because she was the passenger in the car when she got back into the car. So they've been you know, communicating a lot throughout that day. And so they wanted to bring her in specifically to testify about what she saw. What was his demeanor? Was he active down? Was he high sober? What is it, right? You were there. And you may recall that there was a little bit of conversation back and forth about the other witness, Maurice Hall, the other passenger in the vehicle that day. And they were saying that some of his testimony is not going to be allowed because it's not necessary because Shawanda Hill can talk about those things. If we wanted to bring in Maurice Hall and put him on the stand and say, well, what did you think about George Floyd? Was he sober or high? Was he agitated or calm? Whatever. He is not the only person who can testify to that information. So now we have Shawanda Hill can come in and, and do that. And so she did today. We have this clip from her where she's describing Floyd both inside the store and outside the store. And we're going to notice that there was kind of a big difference between his disposition inside and his disposition back outside in the vehicle. So here that is. How would you describe Mr. Floyd's behavior while inside of the cup foods? <laughs> normal talking alert okay. did uh you uh did he offer to give you a ride yes a ride to wherever it was My you were going okay. and um so did you go to his car with him yes once you got into the car did you observe any changes to his demeanor when we were in the car for the first like eight minutes we were talking and you know what I'm saying, hugging, you know what I'm saying, talking about what we were about to do. And then I got a phone call. And so I was on the phone for the rest of the time until the little boys came to the, truck, to the car. He fell asleep at that time. So at some point during the course of the time that you were in the car with Mr. Floyd, Mr. Ho Floyd suddenly fell asleep, yes. right? And the phone call you received, was that from your daughter? Yes. And so you were talking with your daughter during that time. Yes. Um, and you described, uh, would you agree that at, at some point, uh, some you said some little boys, are those employees of the yes. store? <laughs> Sorry, yes. That's okay. 
um, the store employees came and approached the car, correct? Yes. And at that point, Mr. Floyd suddenly fell asleep? He was already asleep. He was already sleeping? Yes, when they came to the car. And when they came there, I tried to wake him up. They tried to wake him up. I tried to wake him up over and over. And his friend tried to wake him up. And he kept, he woke up. Then he'll say something. Uh, he made a little gesture, you know, and nodded back off. Okay. Was he that, did a, that a couple times? Was that a, kind of a sudden change from how you observed him in the store to the car? Yes, but he already told me in the store he was tired because he had been working. I'm object. There is an objection. Mm -hmm. Hold on. All right, so there, there, there's some objections that go that are going on back and forth there. She, she, you know, kind of had a little bit of a difficult time testifying today. Obviously, very emotional, and as as we sort of flushed out at the start of the trial, there's a difference between lay people and experts, people who are professional people who testify in court regularly, cops, use of force experts, consultants, medical people. They're called into court all the time. You have a lay person. This woman obviously, you know, is a lay person. She does not testify frequently. And so she was very, you know, kind of tense, right? Obviously her, her friend is dead and she's now being called in to testify and who knows what, you know, what, what, what effect this is going to have and how she wants this thing to go right now. She's being called to testify by the defense for the guy that, killed allegedly her friend in the car a year ago right so you can have a little bit of compassion for her she's coming out eric nelson is asking her questions and she's being honest it sounds like right she said hey look he was awake in the store then he was not up and down he was kind of coming in and out of it sounds like somebody who might be intoxicated which is exactly why eric nelson brought her in to talk about it right and that that was her perception of it so the, the uh, prosecution comes back out and for the sake of time and because we got so many other witnesses to go through, I didn't clip a lot of the cross-examination and largely because it just wasn't that interesting. Prosecution comes back out, uh, is sort of asking her a line of questions about you know her observations and about Floyd being up and all of these things. And she kind of gets really agitated and she sort of uh, says, what do you want me to do? You want me to say yes? You want me to explain? What do you want me to do? And so, you know, he didn't get much out of her either. Kind of an, an agitated witness, rightfully so, you know, much compassion to her and she was done. So now we have sort of this narrative, this theme building where Nelson is coming out. We know that last minute ingestion is going to be a defense. We know that cause of death they're going to say is heart and drugs. And she is now saying that, well, he actually sort of did appear to be maybe like under the influence of something because he was awake and down and awake. And there were other people who were trying to wake him and he could not wake up. And so this is sort of the, the, the corollary, the converse to what the government was saying about driving under the influence. Remember, we saw that testimony from the toxicologist last week where he came out and they were going through all the charts. Hey, you could drive a car. We have found people who were driving a car up to 50 nanograms per milliliter. No problem at all. And we heard another doctor, I think, testify uh, the same thing with meth, right? You have these high levels. You can drive around. No big deal. But it's variable. It sort of varies person to person just because there is an upper limit that some people can do that doesn't necessarily mean that Floyd could do that. And so she comes out today and says, no, he was actually falling asleep in the car. Then we get his toxicology report and it looks like there was 11 nanograms per milliliter, per milliliter of fentanyl combined with other drugs. So it sort of feels like the toxicology matches the physical signs and symptoms. You have, an, you have a, a connect there. You have a connection. Sometimes in, a, in criminal law, you'll get what's called a disconnect case where you'll see somebody who looks sober as a bird. This is a theory in DUI cases specifically, but you'll have somebody who is you know, perfectly sober, walks the line, stands on one leg, the whole thing. Then they get a toxicology report. We get the, the numbers back and the, the blood alcohol is like a 0.25, right? This person should be falling over. That's how intoxicated the blood results are. And you say that doesn't match. So you call that a disconnect case. Physical signs and symptoms don't match the toxicology reports. And so here, what is happening is Eric Nelson is kind of reversing that. He's saying, no. Oh, okay, what they're saying, the government came out and said, 11 nanograms per milliliter, who cares? And you can drive a car, doesn't mean anything. We went through the pie charts on two different separate drugs. They're trying to say what we saw, George Floyd, his signs and symptoms of intoxication were basically non-existent. That's why they didn't matter. They didn't have, they didn't play a role in his death at all. We have all these experts who say so, didn't impact his breathing, didn't impact his heart, didn't impact anything. 
He was sober. He may have technically had a toxicology report that was 11 nanograms per milliliter, but so what? Because they're alleging, the government, that his signs and symptoms were sober and that that 11 nanograms were not impacting him physiologically. So what Nelson does is said, now we already know that this is 11 nanograms. We already know from other studies this is a very high number. We think that he was under the influence. So he's trying to fill that hole. What's missing? Signs and symptoms. Who does he bring out to fill that gap? Shawanda Hill. She does a pretty good job of doing that. As she just mentioned, he was awake, down, awake, up and down. Nobody could wake him up. Sounds like intoxication. Probably going to sound that way to the jurors also. Then we get to Officer Chang. Officer Chang comes in, and this is an officer who was also at the scene that day, but he was not involved. He was not one of the four officers. So we had Officer Kung, we had uh, Thao, we had Chauvin, and we had, uh, there was another one that's escaping me right now. I forget what it is, but there were four officers there. He was not one of them. And he was somebody who came after the fact and was uh, assigned to go and watch the vehicle. So now Floyd, you know, they walked Floyd back, tried to get him in the back of 320. He kind of kicks himself out the other end of the, the other side. He gets pulled out street side now. Four officers are laying on him. One of the officers gives Officer Chang instructions to go back to the vehicle that Floyd was driving. Go secure the vehicle because we still have Maurice Hall over there and we still have Shawanda Hill. And they both are kind of you know hovering around the vehicle. He's go, go secure the vehicle, go secure the evidence over there. And he does that. And so he, you know, probably the, the biggest gift that he's gotten is, is, during his time on the force, he's not being charged with murder. He is being just a, you know, a witness now. He's a, he's a bystander. And this is the first sign that we see an, another officer, a fellow officer, actually coming out and stating things that are supportive of Chauvin. So you're going to hear from him. His testimony was not very long. A lot of the testimony today wasn't very long, actually very short until we get to Brody or Bro, Brood, who is the last use of force expert that we're going to hear from today. But relatively quick, Nelson just kind of called these people up. What do you got? Boom, 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 boom. Next, move out. And so we got through six people today quickly and the court finished early. So his testimony again was very quick. There was one segment that I did think was important for us. And it is this conversation about the aggressive crowd. So this has been coming up a lot. And I think this is very important to frame before we get to officer Brode, who is the use of force expert that we're going to get to at the end of the show. And at the end of uh, the court today, he was the last person to testify. So we have Officer Chang now. We had a lot of conversation about the crowd, and I thought this was pretty important component of this case because people are asking the question, well, why didn't Chauvin help? He was on his neck for nine and a half minutes. Why didn't he help? Why didn't he render aid? Once he had already gone limp, why didn't they start maneuvering the scene around and render aid immediately? Well, I think the only explanation that legally would make sense that Chauvin would have to proffer is his training told him to not adjust the scene because he was evaluating an external threat. He feared for his safety. And you have to prioritize things in anything that you do, right? If you're going to be making your bed, you got to do one thing before another. And officers have same priority scales. We've gone through a lot of them, right? How do you, how do you move around these use of force charts? And so I was going to, my, my thought was, obviously, I'm not a use of force expert in Minneapolis. I don't know anything about the Minneapolis police other than what we have been covering here. But my guess is they resemble a lot of other law enforcement agencies around this country and that they have pretty clear priorities to protect them, themselves, their lives and the lives of their other officers who are there with them above other lives at the scene. I'm going to guess that there is some sort of hierarchy that exists there. And we're starting to see some of that frame out a little bit. And so uh, one big conversation that, that many of us have been having is about the crowd. Was it an aggressive crowd? Was the defensive posture by Chauvin and the other officers to not render aid reasonable? Was it conducive to the scene? Was it justified for them to not act because they were fearful about the crowd? And we've heard a lot of use of force experts from the prosecution come out and say, no, it wasn't. They should have rendered aid. They should have done something else, but they really weren't there. This guy was there. So let's listen in and see what Officer Chang says about the crowd. Now, in terms of as the crowd or the group of people were uh, uh, congregating around Squad 320, did you notice anything in terms of the tone or tenor of the voices of those people? They were uh, very aggressive. 
Yes. Aggressive towards the officers, yes. Did the, did the volume increase? Uh, yes. And so how, how were you reacting? How were you splitting? How were you reacting to that? Uh, yes, I was uh, focused on car, but then it distracts me and I was concerned for the officer's safety too. So I just kept an eye on as the officers and the car and the in individuals. Okay. Passengers. <coughs> All right, so he let that one linger, and he's not alone, right? We know that other officers have said that. We know that the paramedics who showed up at the scene also didn't want to perform any uh, resuscitation on Floyd right then and there because they also felt like the scene was problematic. So they loaded Floyd up into the back of the ambulance, rolled around the corner, then they started performing CPR using the machine. And so now you've got this guy who was there, uh, presumably you've got Chauvin if he decides to testify, probably will not. Well, maybe he will. We don't know. And we've got him. We've got two paramedics who both testified to that fact. Then we're going to see we have another use of force expert who's testifying to that fact that maybe the crowd was a little bit aggressive and that you really should rely on the officers who were there. Like this guy was not the other people who are academics who are reading books and watching movies on their laptops over at Northwestern is what the defense is going to say. You have people who were here who said it was dangerous. We should believe them, not the intellectuals. So uh, pretty important there, right? This guy was there. He was there. He was on scene. He's a cop, and he's coming out and testifying for the defense on behalf of Chauvin. So pretty, pretty, I think, compelling figure. We also have this woman. This is Nicole, Officer Nicole McKenzie. As I mentioned earlier, she testified for the government. She was a crisis trainer. She's somebody who was, you know, helps train officers on responding to crises. And so the government brought her out to talk about training and all of that. We covered her when that happened. Defense brought her back out to talk about excited delirium. So we're going to, I don't have any clips from her. Not that interesting testimony. Pretty quick witness. She runs through the different elements of uh, excited delirium. She talks about this acronym they use, not a crime. And she goes, and Nelson just walks her through that. Okay, so in Minneapolis, Part of this training material. What does the N stand for? Uh, naked. All right. Naked means uh, if you're if you're in excited deliriums, your body is very hot, so you just start stripping your clothes off so you can cool down. So if you see somebody who's naked, maybe they are experiencing excited deliriums. And so she just runs through the rest of the chart, and then that chart ultimately, I think, gets, gets admitted. They had some conversations about that chart uh, after the jury was sent home for the day, but I think that is coming in. So she lays some foundation. Nelson wants to get that chart in. That's probably going to happen. Then we get to the big witness of the day. Then we, we sort of get to a full afternoon of Barry Broad. It's this officer right here. And this is the use of force expert who is talking for the defense. And you may recall, but I think we had four, three or four witnesses for the prosecution. We had the chief of police. Uh, we had Sergeant Steiger. We had uh, the, the law professor yesterday. We also had, I think, another trainer from the Minneapolis Police Department. I think it was four at least, maybe more than that, all coming in and opining about use of force. And it's an, a pretty important thing, right? If, if Derek Chauvin was, was acting in an unreasonable manner in a way that no objective officer would be acting, that's a pretty big problem because now he's acting outside of the scope of his employment. Clearly, that becomes a felony. Somebody died substantially related to the commission of that felony. That's kind of enough. It's sort of breaking that bubble a little bit. So they have to show that his force was unreasonable or it's very, it's very compelling if they do. And this guy comes out and says, no, it's the opposite of everything that those people said. And he's also very highly credentialed. So this guy has a master's in law enforcement. He's got three degrees, licensed police officer. He started with the Park Police in 1977. Then in 1982, he went over to Santa Rose for 29 years. Defensive tactics instructor, use of force expert, certified by the FBI, blah, blah, blah. The list goes on and on. And you know how this goes by now, right? You know how the, the prosecution and the defense now just bring out a witness and they just run through the laundry list of a resume about all the great things that they've done. This guy, very similar. And his name is Barry, which is basically a cop name. I mean, if it was Harry, it's like a game over. That's a full acquittal. If his, if his name would have been Harry, it's game over. We don't even need the jury. We just say, okay, it's, 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 it's full, full acquittal. But since his name is Barry, it's pretty close. 
almost a cop name. Hey, Barry, right? And so he's, you know, he's pretty, uh, pretty credible guy. And he, is, we got several clips from him. So he starts with the final conclusion first, and then we're going to walk our way back. So let's start here. He's saying that Chauvin was in fact justified. He was acting with total objective reasonableness, and uh, he's following all proper policies and standards along the way. Here is Officer Broad. Now, based upon uh, your training and experience and your expertise in the use of uh, force matters, um, your review of the materials that have been provided to you, have you formed opinions in this particular case to a reasonable, de reasonable degree of professional certainty? I have. And can you just briefly overview your opinions in this particular case? I felt that Derek Chauvin was justified, was acting with objective reasonableness, following Minneapolis Police Department policy and current standards of law enforcement and his interactions with Mr. Floyd. Okay. Um, we've heard a lot over the last couple of weeks about the Graham versus Connor factors. Are you familiar with the Graham versus Connor factors? I am. And can you just very briefly um, uh, provide your definition and your uh, how you look at those factors? So in my 35 years of teaching, it's not just dealing with tactics, but it's dealing with providing an officer the mindset that what they need to justify to use various tactics that they were trained in. And the standard of Graham versus Connor is, you know, what would a reasonable officer have done in a similar set of circumstances that you're doing? Now, the Graham versus Connor factors, the first one is the severity of the crime at issue, correct? Yes. How do you analyze that Graham versus Connor factor? So I know in my experience and the experience. All right. So I stopped there. Now, I think, uh, yeah, so I stopped there. He does go through all of the factors in the rest of his testimony. So we get a conclusion. Then he says, all right, so we got your conclusion. How did you come to that conclusion? Walk us through all these different factors. We've heard a lot about this case, use of force case. And so he goes through all the different elements, just kind of one by one and analyzes them. And remember how we talked about this. There's a, there's a certain format that we use in law called Iraq issue rule application conclusion. IRAC. He's kind of doing that right now. So, so th this witness isn't doing it, but Eric Nelson is doing it. He's saying, all right, so we've got all these different factors. We have all these different rules. We have to answer the question, did Derek Chauvin use unreasonable force or was this reasonable objectively? He's all right, that's our issue. We got all these different rules. We have the Graham factors that we're going to analyze one by one. He does it. He goes through, he says, okay, on that factor, analysis, conclusion, analysis, conclusion. And so he kind of runs through it piece by piece. I have a couple clips from that analysis. This is him right now talking about the officers at the scene. And again, compare this with what Officer Chang said that we played previously. Officer Chang said, Crowd was very aggressive, felt dangerous. I was concerned for my officer's safety. He was there. He was at the scene. And who's telling us who we should listen to? People at the scene or people studying the scene? This now is defense use of force expert Broad. Now, in terms of, again, the, um, the analysis of Graham versus fa of Connor, are there other factors or components of that analysis that are relevant? Yes. Can you explain some of those? So as you're reviewing an incident such as this, you have to try to see it through the eyes of the officers on the scene. You know, what factors were they dealing with? What circumstances? What was the suspect doing? What were onlookers doing? Whether it puts yourself in the officer's shoes to see what they, the decisions they made, were they objectively reasonable or not? So it's, you would agree with the other uh, people who've testified in this case that the standard involves objective reasonableness. Agreed? Yes, I do. Based on the totality of facts and circumstances of this case. That were present to the officer at the time. And a view from a reasonable police officer on the scene. Yes. And what, is, what about hindsight? So it's easy to sit and judge in an office on an officer's conduct. It's more of a challenge to, again, put yourself in the officer's shoes to try to make an evaluation through what they're feeling, what they're sensing, the fear they have, and then make a determination. And so very interesting standard here, right? You can, you can sort of analyze that both ways. This guy's basically saying the default should be what that officer said. So he's, he's kind of, he's saying it's objectively reasonable, but we got to give a lot of credibility, a lot of leeway 
to that subjective interpretation of what that officer experienced that day, right? They're, they were there. So if we're going to err on the side of caution on any of this stuff, it's erring towards the officer at the scene. And that's a, you know, as a defense attorney, that's like, whoa, 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 hold up, hold up there, buddy boy. It's a little too much deference to the cops, right? Because every cop at the scene who ever does anything un unlawful or unreasonable or excessive is always going to say, well, that's what I saw there. That's what I experienced. And who are you to tell me that I didn't experience that fear or I didn't sense that threat? So we're being a lot more deferential to the cops per that standard. On the other hand, he was there. And Chauvin's got some pretty strong corroborating witnesses. He's got Officer Chang who says the crowd was a threat. He's got the two paramedics who say it was a threat. He's got video footage of people on the side of the road screaming at him, right? You're a punk, you're a B, you're a this, I'm a slap you, whatever. All going on. So you wrap all of that up. That does kind of sound like the totality of the circumstances, doesn't it? And that's the police own, that's their own standards. Everything's totality of the circumstances. That's how they wiggle their way out of any liability all the time. And so this use of force expert is coming in and he's executing the cop's playbook beautifully. It's all about objective reasonableness in the totality of the circumstances. And so they're trying to fr frame that out. They're trying to really expand this thing. Whereas the government wants to come back in and say, no, it's only about this specific incident, right? Right then and there. It's not the totality. It's not the crowd. It's not any of this other stuff. It's only what happened for those nine minutes. See what the jury has to say about any of that. Now, here is Broad who goes on and he's talking about deadly force now. So was the prone position deadly force? We have experts who say that it is. We had the law professor yesterday who said that it was. That entire time was deadly force. We saw the chart. We saw the graph. We saw the red line at the top. Nothing in that was appropriate, he said. Now we have a counter witness who's saying basically the opposite. Now, in terms of, again, the, um, the analysis of Graham versus fa of Connor, are there other factors or components of that analysis that are relevant? Yes. Can you explain some of those? So as you're reviewing an incident such as this, you have to try to see it through the eyes of the officers on the scene. You know, what factors were they dealing with? What circumstances? What was the suspect doing? What were onlookers doing? Whether it puts yourself in the officer's shoes to see what they, the decisions they made, were they objectively reasonable or not? So it's, you would agree with the other uh, people who've testified in this case that the standard involves objective reasonableness? Agree yes, I do based on the totality of facts and circumstances of this case that were present to the officer at the time and a view from a reasonable police officer on the scene yes and what is what about hindsight so it's easy to sit and judge in an office on an officer's conduct it's more of a challenge to again put yourself in the officer's shoes to try to make an evaluation through what they're feeling what they're sensing the fear they have, and then make a determination. And all right, so he's uh, once again, he's just honing this thing right back in what was Chauvin experiencing right then and there at that time. And we got to take those facts into consideration. So you can you know, have the government by his argument, you can have them parade as many use of force experts as, as you want up there. You can have everybody come in and talk about, well, you know, this no reasonable officer would have done that. This guy's saying, well, you, but you weren't there, right? So you don't really know. And there are a lot of other factors, characteristics of the scene that maybe will come into play. So when you saw yesterday that law professor said no reasonable person could agree with that. Remember Eric Nelson said, hey, reasonable minds can differ, right? He said on this point, no. Then Eric Nelson said, okay, well, you disagree with your own government witness. You disagree with Sergeant Steiger, who said kind of the opposite of that recently. So this guy is now coming out. We now have basically three witnesses who have different interpretations on all on this scene ex exactly about whether the prone position was use of force. This guy is largely saying that, no, it's not. Steiger was saying it can or cannot be. Then we have the law professor who's sort of characterizing it a different way, saying the whole thing was deadly force. Never put somebody in that position when they're in handcuffs, it's deadly force, was the generalization, I think, of his perspective. So you've got three competing interpretations 
of the same event, which is problematic for the government's case. Now, Steve Schleicher, prosecutor, comes back out, does a very nice job cross-examining this witness right here. And this witness, I think, lost a little bit of credibility during his cross-examination because he was very, very ornery. Let's just leave it at that. He was very entrenched, and you can see this just sort of in his body posture and his, his phraseology. You can see how he's just waiting for a gotcha question. He's kind of just, hmm. And then he comes back out and he says, no. Or yes, he's answering it very, very clearly, not putting a lot of meat on the bones. And Steve Schleicher's last question, I don't think I clipped it, but the last question with this witness, he was very irritated with him. He basically said, uh, you know, he asked him a long form question. The guy says yes or no. He says yes. And Steve wants him to go and make some additional statements about that. And he responds, he says, I said yes. And then he looks at him like, you piece of, and then he walks right off the podium. So I didn't clip that because uh, I, uh, I'm a terrible person, but let's listen in on this one. So this one, Steve Schleicher, Schlucher, is now cross-examining this witness, and he is making it hurt. He's twisting the knife a little bit. So this guy just got done saying that Chauvin's actions were reasonable, right? Reasonable use of force, objectively reasonable. Any officer in that position would have done the same thing because it's objectively reasonable. So then Steve comes out and he just twists it right in his back, that knife a little bit. Oh, you think that's reasonable? Well, how about this section of the video? How about that? Here, here's George Floyd crying out for mama. He's saying, I can't breathe. My stomach hurts. My neck hurts. My shin hurts. Everything hurts. Everything is off. And he goes through minute by minute. Was that, was that reasonable? So a reasonable officer would have also heard him say that, he can't breathe and just ignored that. Is that reasonable? And he says, well, uh, yes, in certain situations. Okay, so how about this one? When uh, And he just walks them through every stinking sentence. And it's painful, but it's very effective cross-examination. So here's a little bit of that. A reasonable police officer in the defendant's position would have heard that, correct? I believe so. From his position on top of Mr. Floyd. True. It's possible. And the bystanders who were there, uh, again, you couldn't hear any noise interference or anything like that. True? <clears throat> not then, no. All right. And so would it be fair to say that there is nothing that the bystanders were doing at that moment in time that we just watched that would have been distracting or preventing the defendant from attending to Mr. Floyd? Not during that video clip, no. Okay. All right. So he's just... Just digging that in there. And if you watch the whole cross-examination, it's just a lot of that. All right. So we got, let's play this 10 seconds from that exhibit. It's George Floyd's, you know, crying out. He goes, oh, so an officer who's laying on top of him probably would have heard that, right? A reasonable officer would have heard that. Probably would have done something about that. You know, if he just heard somebody saying, I can't breathe, like alone, would they have said, maybe I should do something about that? A reasonable officer? Yeah, maybe is what he says. So it's just like, <laughs> it's drawing it out. And he was not happy about it, nor should he be because it's, it uh, doesn't make him look good, of course, which is exactly what they're trying to do. So let's jump into some questions over from our Locals platform, Locals.com. You can find our community over there called Watching the Watchers or just go to watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And our first question comes from Deep State. It says all the state witnesses said if it were fentanyl overdose, they would have expected Floyd, Floyd to fall asleep. We saw testimony today that he did, in fact, fall asleep. Is there any angle left for the prosecution to refute the reasonable doubt that should exist based on that alone? So that's a very good point. Excellent observation. And you're exactly right. And I didn't catch that, but you're exactly right. That That's true, right? We had several different medical examiners, people who came out and said that no fentanyl overdose is ind indicated by passing out or going comatose and all of that type of statement uh, testimony. And that's exactly what we heard today. Is there any angle left for the prosecution to refute the reasonable doubt that should should exist based on that alone? Um, well, yeah, I mean, I think you could make an argument for it, right? You could still say that. So what if he fell asleep? So what if fentanyl did have a role in it? They were still there. There's still the the argument that it wouldn't have killed him anyways, right? That's really what they're saying. They're saying that the drugs don't matter. They're saying that the heart didn't matter. They're saying that the but for cause here was the knee on the neck. In other words, there is nothing that would have killed Floyd except for Chauvin's knee. That's going to be their argument. The sleeping thing, whether fentanyl had a role, I think that they knew that was sort of, sort of part of the game and they're doing stuff to rebut that. 
but they're still saying that it was low oxygen and asphyxia and that fentanyl really had nothing to do with that. All that, that all of that was caused by Chauvin and his knee news. Now Wyoming says, I still can't believe the use of force expert could say with a straight face that this was a comfortable position for George Floyd. <laughs> did he, did he say that? I missed that. Did he say it was a comfortable position? Uh, did he say that specifically or did he say the prone position is generally a safe and comfortable position? If he said, if he said George Floyd was comfortable, uh, that would sort of, I think, throw his credibility right out the window because we could all see that that is not the case. Uh, we have woodworking medic says, I really don't see that the prosecution proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Chauvin is guilty with the defense starting out in a pretty good footing with their case. How important or how much sway do you think closing arguments will have on the jury? So I think a lot at this point, the reason why I say a lot at this point is because we still haven't seen, I think, the full display of Nelson's case. And so I'm not real sure what he's going to do with that yet. I'm not sure if he's going to, you know, call Chauvin tomorrow or, 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 or you know, any other people to come in and talk about fentanyl and overdose or if he had a, you know, uh, a different medical examiner to come in and review the autopsy. Like we still don't know what the rest of his case looks like yet. He hasn't really gotten into a lot of medical testimony about any of the heart uh, analysis or any of that stuff. Don't know if he is, he's going to wrap up this week. So he may just be flying through this thing. But if he, if he is going to lay a lot more out, if we have, you know, additional witnesses, we still got Wednesday and Thursday and maybe even Friday. So there's still, you know, a significant chunk of witnesses forthcoming, I would guess. And we already saw six today. So the pace is going to pick up, but if he lays a lot of it out on the table, then closing arguments would not necessarily be that important. But if he is sort of being a little bit coy about his strategy and he's going to button it all up, wrap it all up in a nice bow during closings. Well, then obviously that latter strategy makes the closing that much more impactful. It's it's that much more necessary that it seals the deal because we have a lot of, we have a ton of issues in this case. It's hard to keep track of if you are using PowerPoints and you're observing this stuff. I mean, imagine being a juror who doesn't have any legal background, who doesn't have all of the tools and skill set and education and ability to sort of read the news and get alternative information and analyze and go and say, oh, I was wrong about that. What does that say? And go look that up, type that into Google, find out who that person is. We all have that. They don't. So there's a lot that they're going to have to sort of uh, dig through in order to make sense of all this. And that's where the closing argument really comes into play. NY Renal MD says, I think it's a disconnect case, as you say. I work with methadone, fentanyl, and meth patients. He wasn't behaving as someone under the influence. In an overdose, you don't go from 60 miles per hour to zero in a second. Unless there is a needle in his arm, you can't just achieve that kind of anesthesia. Yeah, so that's a good question, right? And I think we have we have a lot of questions about the timeline, really, and and how this all how this all fleshed out, right? You have the absorption phase, you're a doctor, so you know how this works, right? You absorb, your body absorbs, you peak, you sort of dissipate whatever the active metabolites are, your body processes those in inactive metabolites. We've gone, we've gone through some of that analysis with active fentanyl and norfentanyl during the government's case in chief. And you're right. I mean, Floyd was, he, he, we saw a video of him in the store up. We saw her, her testimony today that in the car, he was down. We saw potentially a pill in his mouth at the last minute. Then we have questions about consumption and processing. We heard another doctor testify that if you consume fentanyl, you you would expect to reach peak depression of respiratory function at about five minutes, which would have been right about five minutes after they pulled him out of the back of the police vehicle. So a lot of commingled issues. Jury's going to have some serious work to do. Osak says, do you think the prosecution is putting on a good case? Yeah, I mean... Uh, to me, it looks like they're half-assing it. Possibly they think this is an OD and also not pushing hard. I don't I don't see that at all, Osak. I think that their case has some pretty big questions in it, but I think they're working extremely hard on this case. And we've seen that, I, I think, just symbolically in the amount of resources that they've mustered up in order to prosecute this. I mean, this is not, you know, this case, by, by my count, I think we've covered 10 or 11 different prosecutors on the case. Pro hoc viches. Uh, which are motions for other attorneys who don't even live in the state to come in and practice in the state. Those were happening all throughout the case. Even I think as recently as jury selection, we saw some, some new attorneys come on board. So they are bringing out all the stops. They've got the whole, you know, the whole prosecutor's office, I think is oriented towards securing a conviction here. But sometimes you just have some questions in your case. You got some bad facts. Maybe that's what you're seeing from the prosecutors. 
We've got Liberty or Death says, <coughs> excuse me, I, at first I thought Chauvin would testify to clear this up. However, now I don't see a strong need for it. Maybe safer not to. Casey Anthony isn't in jail because she didn't testify. Jody Arias is because she thought her side of the story would clear things up. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I'm thinking more and more, probably not testify. You know, that's that's the general rule. As I mentioned, 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm not expecting him to testify. Don't think it would be a good idea to, to, to presume that he would testify. I think really the only reason that you need him to come in is to explain the, the length of time, the nine minutes on the neck. If you can get a good explanation about that in another way, then I think that is, is the better approach to go. If I had to, if I had to say, because right now it's looking, look, if it's a 50, 50 case, Chauvin wins, right? Automatically. If it's 50-50, that's not beyond a reasonable doubt. That's 50-50. If it's like, hey, it could have been Chauvin's knee, could have been the drugs or the heart. I don't know. It's a coin toss. That's a not guilty verdict, like automatically easy. It has to be significantly more than that. And so, you know, right now, I'm not sure that it's, a, that it, that it's an equation that requires drastic action like testifying, which is exactly what that would be. So I think you're right on track, Liberty or Death. I'm not sure that I see a need at this moment for him to testify. Uh, Liberty says, help us settle this one. Comply and take the rest. Get to the jailhouse. Give us a call or two. Resist and get in a fight with the cops. So uh, our, our, <laughs> our typical advice on this is you don't say anything, right? Other than the, the three things that you have to comply with, your name, your ID, your registration. If you're stopped in a car, you got to identify yourself. Other than that, you know, you're complying and you are not offering up anything. You just, and you call us, you have your, our, our number on speed dial. We say it's better to know us and never need us than it is to need us and not know us. That's why it's helpful to have a defense lawyer's phone number in your car because typically, and I've gotten on the phone with people when there's cops outside of their car and had conversations with cops over a cell phone on the car. And it doesn't go, it's never gone bad for me when I've been involved in that, right? It's never turned into one of these situations. So that is a, that is one way to do it, but I know not everybody can have an attorney on speed dial. And so yes, generally the, the you know, the, the thoughts are comply, take the rest, get to the jailhouse, give us a call. Yeah. I mean, yes, for the safe, for the safety of this, I'm not giving any legal advice here. I'm not giving any legal advice. No legal advice. This is not legal advice for about the fifth time. But yet, there, there are certain ways to interact with the police that make things go a little bit more smoothly. There are other situations, other responses that make things go poorly. That's just the nature of the situation, of the, of the, the world we live in. You may not like that. You may say that there needs to be some serious justice reform and maybe police shouldn't be making high risk arrests in the middle of a traffic, you know, traffic e roadway and have some policy distinctions about what we can do to change it to stop these types of interactions. But yeah, as it exists currently, turning and running and trying to flee from an arrest that's taking place on the side of the road is not a smart thing to do. It's not good. It's not good to not comply with the officers because you might get killed. Now, if you want to take that stand, if you want to sort of push your luck on that, then you can you can do that. Again, this is not legal advice. That's that's just a decision that some people make. But the cops, man, they are they're on a hair trigger. We see it all over the place. So if you want to if you want to get a little bit aggressive with them, typically it doesn't work in your favor. There is a lot you can do after the fact, right? File a civil lawsuit, file complaints. Tough stuff. We got murder of crows in the house. Says my question for Robert is this. Sorry if you've answered this a hundred times. If I were a juror and I came to believe that Mr. Floyd died from a multitude of factors, including the drugs overdose, Mr. Floyd's health problems, and Officer Chauvin's actions, would I vote guilty on any of the charges? If I only thought one was a proximate factor in Minnesota, I think that's a vote for guilty on the manslaughter two charge. Very good question, murder. So the way that this is going to work, and I know a lot of people are asking these questions. There, there is actually a mechanism that we use in law in order to answer this question. It's called jury instructions. The reason why we haven't talked about this quite yet is because they haven't been settled right now. So what we know right now is, generally speaking, not in this case in, in, in particular, we know what Chauvin's been charged with. We've seen the government's evidence. We've seen some of the state's evidence, uh, the defense evidence but we're still not quite there yet. So we know the charges. We know the three charges. We know what the statutes say. 
but we haven't interpreted those into lay people terms for the jury. And so if you want to get a look at how this works, murder of crows, Google NOR jury instructions, Minnesota, N O O R jury instructions, Minnesota, and you're going to see what happens. So both sides now are going to come together. And the way that this works, we're going to spend a lot of time on this. So I don't want to go too deep on it right now, but we have what are called, uh, 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 what does Minnesota call them? M M J something, whatever they're, they're jury instructions, right? They're sort of scripted templates of jury instructions based on the charges. So you go, okay, we've got a, a, a murder charge. And the jury instructions say if if so and so did so and so, then that person can be convicted of murder. And it writes it out in a way that's sort of like paint by numbers. Put the green ones in number in the in the yellow in the number one boxes and paint the three boxes purple and paint the the four boxes red, right? And you have a nice little beautiful giraffe or whatever you're drawing. So it's it's kind of like that. It's jury instructions. And you start from a template, and then both sides will make suggestions and modifications. So the government's going to come out and say, no, we don't like that. We want to modify this to explain it this way. The defense is going to do the same thing. And both of those are going to be settled by the court. So then we're going to have an official set of jury instructions that are going to tell us exactly what the law is and how it all works. And when it comes down to Minnesota, to answer your question, there is, my understanding is there is some sort of language in there about substantial factor, substantial factor in the cause of death. Then it defines what a substantial factor is. And then the jury is going to have to weigh the evidence against that standard. So we're going to get more information about how these rules work and how they all fit together, but we're just not there yet because it hasn't been fleshed out. So I'm sorry that I don't have a better answer for you, Murder of Crows, but there is going to be one forthcoming. We're just not there yet. We'll be there soon, probably by the end of the week, uh, if not first of next week, because I think the defense and the prosecution. Hey, you know what is a great website to go to? Go to, let me see if I can pull this up very quickly, because I just I was just reading this. Legal insurrection. Let's take a look. They have, let me show you this right now. This is great. This guy's doing a great job, by the way, since we're talking about jury instruction. So go over here to legalinsurrection.com. And you can uh, see here, trial day 12. I really think it's day 24 if you can count jury selection, but they have already done the heavy lifting for us down here. So we've got murder in the second degree defined. We've got murder in the second degree elements, manslaughter in the second degree elements, all these different elements. And then they've already pulled for us the proposed jury instructions. So we've got state's proposed instructions. Then we have the defense proposed instructions. Those were filed earlier in, uh, in looks like February. And then if you look up uh, NOR uh, jury instructions, let's see here, high profile cases. So when we go over to NOR, you're going to see that it looks like this. So let's zoom in just a quick bit. And it's going to tell us, it's going to give us some guidance. So let's say murder in the third degree. Under Minnesota law, a person causing death of another by perpetrating an act imminently dangerous to others and evincing a depraved mind is guilty of murder in the third degree. And then it goes through and it says, okay, so what is murder in the third degree? It tells us what it is. Then it tells us this. The elements of murder in the third degree as alleged in this case are as follows. First, Justine Rusek, the death of her was proven. Then Mohammed Nuor caused the death. Third, it was an intentional act which caused the death, was imminently dangerous to human beings and performed without regard for human life. Fourth, Mohammed Nuor, it took place within Hennepin County. If you find each of these elements has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt, the defendant is guilty of this charge. Same thing with manslaughter, right? Which is more applicable to what we're talking about uh, here. Manslaughter in the third degree, murder in the second degree. So this is intent to kill. Yeah, so you're going to see something that looks exactly like that. That's what the jurors got when they went back and deliberated in the Noor case. And we're going to see something very similar to that in Chauvin's case, but we just haven't fleshed out what this final page looks like. But we will get there. Very good question, and thanks for letting me take a little bit of a tangent there and show you around.